Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today, we're gonna unbox, build, and print with the new TiVo Tarantula Pro. Well, let's dig right in. So I haven't really been following TiVo's new printers very closely. I have uh, worked on an original Tarantula but I'm sure a lot has changed in the meanwhile. The build volume of this is 235 by 235 by 250 millimeters tall. And much like something like an Ender 3, you assemble it from nearly bare components. Everything is very nicely packaged, actually. So we've got a little build tack kind of sticker there for the hotbed. The hot end assembly here is very much like what they use on the TiVo Flash. Um, it's kind of like a older version of the Volcano hot end um, with a very beefy but shallow heat sink on the top here. Um, and then two uh, cooling fans, one on either side, which actually works quite well on the, um, on the Flash. One trolley in a new shade of TiVo green. Bunch of 2020s, one more here. The TiVo Titan extruder. It's a three to one geared extruder based on E3D's design. Stepper motors. The hotbed, and this is the Y carriage for the hotbed. Layer two, we have the control box using the same kind of aircraft connectors we've seen on other printers, a little smaller one here. And they're running a MKS Gen L board, which is what they used on the newer incarnation of the TiVo Tornado as well. More 2020s and 2040s. And inside these, there's a lead screw. Belts, USB and power cables, little warranty card, some more bags of bolts and hardware, LCD screen cable, a scraper, a couple pieces of PTFE, power supply, and so it is a 24 volt, uh, 200 watt power supply. It's unbranded, it seems. There's another stepper motor here, as well as a bracket. And then a small coil of some filament uh, to test print with. Oh, I almost missed something. Under this little panel, there's this. So this is, I've seen a few of these, yeah, the 12864 uh, LCD. Um, so kind of like a smaller, a little bit of a higher res screen, and it's also got the SD card in the front, which is nice. So if you didn't unbox the entire printer like I did, they refer to the parts in individual compartments in the foam packaging, one layer at a time. Um, so the first step is AO1. So we're gonna take the screw bag labeled A01 and then the three extrusions that were found in that part, which are these three. The manual shows this one with only four holes. Ours has five and one is offset. So I'm not sure which orientation this goes in. So we'll have to figure that out. But these two have recessed holes here for the heads of bolts to sink into. And there are recessed holes on the side as well. This part here is gonna be bolted between these two pieces, like 
this with the screws found in this bag. So I'll set these like this. So there's gonna be M5 bolts as well as lock washers in here among other pieces. So we're gonna take these really long M5 bolts because I have to reach right through these extrusions. Feed them through here. And then they will bolt into, sorry, they'll bolt into this guy. So there's just gonna be two of these, one on either side. So I laid this flat on the work table here just to make sure that everything stayed flush and in alignment there. So on the bottom, there are these recessed holes. They're recessed on both sides. And as you can see there, there are five, not four holes. This one is offset. I'm not sure if it matters which side it's offset on, but we'll figure that out together. So the rest of the hardware that we were left with from that bag is uh, for the feet and for the Y rail here. So starting with the feet, we're gonna take one of these hammer nuts and these four silver M4 by 20 screws. The screws are gonna drop into the feet with any luck, out the other end. And then the hammer nuts, you can just slide them in the uh, extrusion. So we're going to put them in the outer we're gonna put them in the outer slot of the extrusion, and then we should be able to just bolt right down into them. In this case, because we were able to insert them right into the end of the extrusion, they should already be rotated, so you don't have to worry about them kind of engaging or anything. We may end up uh, adjusting the final placement of those later on. Let's try this one a different way. Just gonna loosely thread it on while holding the wrench in the screw and then just slide it in. All right, so now we have that. So now we're gonna take this uh, 2040 rail that has four recessed holes here. Those are for the M5 bolts that are gonna bolt down into four of the five holes in this cross member. Uh, the way I'm assembling it here, the cross member is further back, um, if that makes sense. And so this will be um, assembled so that it sticks out further towards the front. Okay. So as I said, M5 bolts, there's only four left from that bag. Put a lock washer on them and just thread them into the tapped holes on that cross beam. So I haven't fully tightened this, but um, not in the tapped holes, obviously, but in the drilled holes in this top piece here, there is some room for movement. Um, so we wanna make sure that this is square 90 degrees. Um, ideally, I would have my machinist square here and use that. Um, in light of that, I'm just gonna use this bracket, should be 90 degrees, and I can kind of rest it here and make sure that this is squared up as I tighten these down. This is definitely not a uh, proper or scientific way of doing it, but it's better than eyeballing it for sure. Okay, looks good. So I think that's it for the base here. Next step in the manual is to assemble the front plate here. So obviously we have the screen, the screen's gonna go back here but we need a couple of the bolts and such from A02, screws A02. There are some brass standoffs here that have to go between the LCD and the front plate. 
So we're going to use, get our Allen keys. So there are three standoffs. There should probably be four. Yep. Four standoffs, one for each of these holes. I'm not gonna fully snug them up yet though, it's just so we can adjust them if we need to um, kind of fix the alignment between the standoffs and the holes on the LCD board. So now we have the four standoffs kind of sandwiched onto this front plate. The LCD screen is going to go like that. With any luck, everything lines up. Yeah, I will need to adjust them a little bit, so that's fine. And so we have four more of these little black screws, M3s. And we're just gonna bolt through the back of the LCD panel. Okay. Just loosening those standoffs to allow me to kind of wiggle it around. There we go. So now the next hole will line up here. It's funny, just seeing this label, remove seal after washing, reminds me of the TiVo Tornado unboxing video that I did where I had no idea what that was. And it's just a seal for when they're washing the, LC or the circuit board there that it keeps the wash liquid out of the little beeper. So I'll pull that off. So there we go. Nice tactile knob and the LCD, or sorry, the SD card is a little bit recessed still back. Um, let's just take a look here. Yep, that's fine. Okay, so that part is done, I believe. Now we have some M5s and hammer nuts here. I'm not sure what these are for. Let's take a look back at the manual again. All right, those M5s and the hammer nuts, those are going to go in here. So there are four of them. That's gonna allow us to attach this front plate to one of these extrusions in the base. So just in case you're not aware, um, you want the thinner part of the hammer nut to be on the side where the head of the bolt is, if that makes sense. Looks like this metal plate here got a little bit bent on this one end. So, see here, a little bit bent, so we'll have to gently pry that back. It's really just decorative, so it's not gonna affect the performance or anything. I'm just super loosely um, threading those on just so they don't go missing. Okay, so now we're done with that. I believe. Let's move on to the next step. So now that we have the screen attached to the front plate and our base here, the next step is assembling some brackets and stepper motors. Now all four of these stepper motors are the same. I checked the, uh, the model number on the back, which is nice that they include that so you can get the spec sheet if that's interesting to you. Um, but obviously one of them does have uh, the drive gear for the Titan extruder. Um, it's not even, it doesn't have a set screw, so it's likely pressed onto here. So that makes that one unique in that sense. So we're gonna start with bag A03. I've already used a 
few, so I'll clean up my garbage. AO3, here we go. In this bag, there's a bunch of hammer nuts again and some bolts. There is a toothed gear, this little L bracket, two of these half um, bearings, sorry, like idler bearings. Uh, and we're going to need a stepper motor that is not for the Titan. We're gonna take these M4 by eight uh, screws and drop them down in these two holes here and attach T-nuts to the back of them. Just as is usual, just loosely thread them on. Okay. And then this longer guy is gonna go in here and on him, he has an aluminum spacer, the two bearings. And so these bearings are going to go with the shoulders on them away from each other to create a track in the middle like that. A self-locking nut. So it's the only nylock nut in here. So this is starting to look familiar. This would be the idler that's at the front probably. Um, but we're done with that for now. Next up is this flat bracket here, beefy guy. Um, we're going to have, obviously the motor is going to go through here like this. And we're going to use these M3s down in the top to secure that. Um, they show the plug uh, being like like this, I believe. Yeah, they show the plug like that. We can easily change it later if we need to. So just take the four black M3 bolts that are left over from that package and attach the motor. All right, so we've got that guy. Then there are three M4 by eights. So that would be these silver ones. They're gonna come up through these three holes here. And on the top, they're just going to have hammer nuts. There are three hammer nuts. So that will attach to the extrusion, obviously. And so that's done. Um, there's this toothed gear here. There is a flat on this motor, so you wanna line that up with the grub screw. And they give some guidance around how far that should be. It says 20 to 20.1 millimeters from the base to the top of this. Um, it's very specific, so I'll have to get calipers and measure that. For now, I'm just gonna eyeball it. I can easily come back here and loosen the set screw and adjust how far up or down this is. Okay. All right, so then that's done. So now we're gonna start assembling some of the Y carriage uh, and we need bag BO2. BO2, it's pretty obvious it's the one with the wheels. So as is kind of typical, the assembly of these, you'll have uh, eccentric nuts on a few of them and then just uh, spacers on the other. So starting uh, at the top, you'll have to throw the, um, the bolt through and then usually a small washer or spacer, then the eccentric nut with the little protruding eccentric piece facing down or towards where it's gonna be threaded, however you wanna look at that. And in this case, we're gonna put the two eccentric nuts in these larger holes in the carriage. They won't actually fit in these ones. So seat that in there and then just put the nylock washer, or sorry, nylock nut on the other side. 
I'll tighten that up in a second. So again, the assembly is put the bolt through. Oops, the inner ring on this one is not quite in line. There we go. So bolt, little spacer, eccentric nut right here. Slide that in and then that on this side. And so now we can adjust the wheels on this side. These two are just gonna be standard stationary wheels. Um, the assembly is just marginally different. Again, inside this one, there's a little spacer in the center and it is not lined up, so I can't get the bolts through. There we go. So a little bit different, just a aluminum spacer, and that's that. One more. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and tighten all these down. So after you've tightened them all down, just make sure that they all still spin freely. Um, they shouldn't be so tight to cause any kind of binding. Um, and you want to be able to move the eccentric nuts. So. Um, they shouldn't be so tight that you have a difficult time kind of spinning these around, but you still want them kind of tight enough that they don't come loose on their own. That's a bit of a balancing act. I tend to opt on the tighter than not side. There we go. Okay. So we'll end up adjusting those when we get this seated on the rails. All right, so we have the Y carriage, we have our base, and now we want to attach the two. Um, so essentially we're just gonna slide it over top of this 2040, assuming that we have the eccentric nuts in the loosest position, that should allow us to slide easily. I'm just gonna take a quick look at the instructions here. Um, yep, slide it on the end as shown, uh, and it shows, okay. So it shows these tabs, being on the right, if you're facing the front, remember the front is where this piece extends further, shows it being on the right. So your right, my left, these tabs. So this is going to slide over the top of here. Now I may have to loosen this eccentric nut here just to allow it enough clearance to slide on. There we go. Now is a good time as any to, to adjust those eccentric nuts to make sure that there's adequate pressure. If you've seen any of my other videos, um, you'll know that the way I gauge adequate pressure is that I should be able to roll any one wheel and it grips the rail and all the other wheels should also be rolling when you're uh, moving any one wheel manually. Moves nice and smooth, there's no detents or flat spots or anything like that. Good. So now this idler, they show it on the front here in an L like that. So the idler is furthest away from the back of the printer or furthest towards the front of the printer. Um, I don't think it actually matters because you should be able to compensate with just shortening the belt length that you end up using. But to follow the uh, instruction manual exactly, Make sure it's oriented like that. And I'm just randomly kind of attaching this to the front. Okay. So after those two steps, it shows a small picture of a end stop and a bracket, um, but it's in a bag that we haven't opened. So that's in B03-1. It shows one of these brackets. This is just a protective film on the, on the faces of it. Peel that off. And then take one of these end stops and you will orient it 
like that. This recess here is just for the end of the soldered joints underneath. And so there'll be the self-tapping little silver screws. They are Phillips. All right. So I flipped the base over. This is now the back of the printer. And we're gonna attach this bracket with a stepper motor for the Y-axis. This is where the belt's gonna loop around and around that idler we just installed. Make sure that you're installing the motor on the, first of all, the bracket goes on the underside of this middle rail and make sure that the motor itself is on the same side as those tabs on the Y carriage, as well as the idler on the front. I've already got the T-nuts on there from before. I'm just kind of aligning the bracket with the back of the middle rail. And you might want to peek down the channels to make sure that your T-nuts are actually rotating in them and, and engaging securely. Otherwise, they're uh, serving no purpose. There you go. Okay. All right, we're getting there. I'm gonna have to come back obviously and adjust these uh, eccentric nuts. I'm not sure what the heck happened there. So now we're gonna loop the belt. So this is always fun. Uh, the belt is held on to those tabs on the Y uh, by zip ties. And when you're zip tying it, I'm just gonna show you here because it's gonna be easier. Uh, you're gonna wrap it like this so that the teeth are um, nested within each other. So that makes sure that it doesn't slip on you and slip a tooth. Uh, and then you would zip tie around here to pinch it and leaving yourself a big enough loop to hook around the little tab. In this case, the tabs here, hopefully you can see that one there, the gaps don't have a, it's not a slot, it's actually like a hole. So you have to thread this through and then uh, loop it over on top of itself like that and add your zip ties. Um, on other models, it's a slit, and so you can do the loop before and slide it kind of up, up the slit. So are these both the same length? Because we're gonna need one for X and one for Y. Yes, they are. Okay. So the teeth are going to always face the middle, if you will. Um, so they would never be facing the outside, because obviously they have to grab the tooth gear at the back here and wrap around the idler at the front. And then uh, around those tabs. So to start, I'm gonna attach it to the back tab, zip tie it as I described, and then uh, we'll make our way to the front as we kind of thread it through the path that it needs to follow. So I've zip tied the rear one um, to the one loop on the Y carriage here, and I've routed the belt um, around through the front and back through the next one. So I'm ready to like do my next set of zip ties around here. Problem is, is you're not gonna be able to keep a lot of tension on this while you zip tie it. So one way to kind of cheat and make sure you have the correct amount of tension and the ability to tension it um, is to move this idler in a little bit. Um, then we'll do it as tight as we can by hand and then that gives us that little bit to pull this idler back to apply tension to the belt. Hopefully that makes sense, but I'll try to demonstrate. Um, so I'm just gonna loosen the two T-nuts, hammer nuts on the top here, move the belt in, I don't know, five, seven millimeters, something like that. And I've retightened them. And now I'm gonna put, you know, kind of as much pressure as I reasonably can on this belt, interlock the teeth, Okay, and we can see the belt is still really, really loose. That's fine though, that's why we moved this in. So once I've zip tied this, we'll, we'll pull this back towards the front to apply pressure there. So I add two zip ties on either loop around the carriage there, and you wanna keep the zip ties as close as possible to the, uh, the carriage little tabs. Um, and then trim off any excess belt that is left overlapping. Um, otherwise, sometimes that belt can end up wrapping around the tooth gear here, around the idler here, and kind of screw things up at the uh, extremes. Um, so I've got all this extra belt here. I'm just gonna snip this off. 
And as I mentioned, it's very loose, but that's fine. We'll use that few millimeters on the idler here. Pull this tight. Now, it probably would have been smart of me to leave a little extra of that uh, slack here uh, until I was sure that I had this idler as far forward as I wanted. Um, it is still about four millimeters back from the very front. But that'll be fine for now. I'm just going to readjust those idlers, or sorry, the uh, eccentric nuts. I'm not sure why they've already come loose. I may have to end up tightening the bolt that goes through the carriage and through those nuts a little bit more. Much better. Okay, so I think we're ready to move on to the next step. All right, so that end stop that we assembled or partially assembled before, we're gonna take one of these socket cap black M5 by eight bolts, put it through that slot. We're gonna add a T-nut. And then this is going to go, shows it on the side, yeah, by the idler. So I was just checking how far down the rail to put it. You want that button to be depressed before the carriage here hits this bracket, right? So that looks good. So a couple quick things. Um, my mind uh, clearly was thinking about Ender 3s, uh, where the idler is in the front. So what I've been referring to as the front is actually the back. Anyway, with that said, um, the control box here is going to go with those aircraft connectors facing away from the stepper motor. We've got the unit upside down, obviously here. Um, and in this case, it's going to be on the same side as the belt. So it will go like this. There are two holes in this little tab that's gonna line up with the back of this 2040 here. And there is one hole in the base right there, which is where we're going to take this M5 bolt, thread it through there, and a hammer nut. And that will attach this corner to the underside of the middle rail. And then as I said, there'll be two bolts that go into the threaded uh, holes on the back of the extrusion there. There we go. And I don't think I have the bolts for the back of the extrusion yet. So they show bolts coming from the bag labeled A04. I happen to be, use the exact same bolts from another bag we already had open. A04 contains a bunch of these flat head bolts as well as hammer nuts for them. Um, so we've already used the one on that corner. Um, there'll be two more that go through the extrusion, though it doesn't show these ones being those two on that tab, which is interesting. Ah, there, they show it on the next step. So the two of these are going to go into this tab here, which should, with any luck and a little wiggling, line up with the threaded holes. That's good and secure. And then the power supply, in a similar fashion, gets added on this side. And this bracket has holes on top, so obviously that's gonna bolt into the top side of this one with some hammer nuts with these same bolts. Okay. 
And this one will probably be easiest done right side up. If your hammer nuts cooperate, you should be able to just slide this right on up there, but there we go. And then just press all the way forward until this is flush with the end of the extrusion. Tighten these down. So let's flip this around so that Y-axis motor is up at the front there. And that's going to be behind the faceplate. So if you remember, we attached T-nuts and bolts through the sides. This is going to go That is wrong. That way. It makes way more sense. Just having some difficulties because of that bent tab on the one end. There we go. Okay, so finally everything is nestled in there. I'm just gonna keep it flush with the middle rail and then tighten it down. If you're having a difficult time getting your T-nuts to rotate, you can kind of back the screw off and then rapidly twist in the tightening direction and that should force it to flip. All right, it's kind of resembling a printer. So when you have something like an Ender 3, this is kind of the stage that you start with where the, the platform is already assembled. So now we're uh, in the home stretch, so to speak. All right, so now we're gonna use the items from bag BO2-1. This contains the bed springs and the screws to attach the heat bed. They've also got these neat, uh, these are 3D printed, uh, little nuts. Many people were printing their own because grabbing the little nuts is kind of difficult to do. So it's kind of nice that they have those now. And the heat bed is insulated, which is kind of standard these days with cutouts for the screws. So we're gonna drop these screws in. They are countersunk. Um, just before I do that, I'm just gonna peel off this protective film here. All right. So I just peeled off the protective film. We happen to have two layers of film on ours. Now I feel comfortable dropping these in. I didn't want the film to get uh, kind of pinched between the heads of these bolts and the uh, aluminum plate. So. And we're missing one. There it is. Great. So I've dropped those down in there. Then we're gonna have uh, these springs. They're kind of stuck together. There we go. So this, this becomes kind of difficult to show. So we're going to have a spring on each of these bolts, and then we're going to line these bolts and drop them into the holes on the corners of this carriage. Um, you can kind of do, <laughs> see, you can kind of do one at a time. And then just lift up the other corners so to give you enough clearance to slide the next spring on. All right, that one's still there. And then the one I dropped. Excellent. Okay. Great. So now we can just attach these nuts. There we go. Okay. 
Um, so these screws will kind of rotate until there's tension on them. They'll, you have to kind of hold them with your thumb or throw an Allen key in them to stop them from rotating. And I'm not really tightening these down much, just enough to put a little preload on that spring um, to stop things from wiggling free. There we go. Okay. And we'll obviously come back and adjust them when we're doing our bed leveling. The other option is you can screw down from above with the right Allen key, of course. and just hold the wheel stationary. I didn't mention it, but it should be obvious. Make sure that the cable coming out of the back of the heat bed is on the right side. Um, so we have it at the rear here, of course, but I could see you might overlook that and have the uh, cable coming out the front. And so this cable is going to connect into one of those aircraft connectors on the back. They all have a different number of pins and there's a little groove here to align. So this one has four pins. Figure out where the groove is. There we go. All right. So now it wants us to assemble the trolleys here. This side has the extruder on it, obviously. And then this is the bracket for the other side. We're gonna use bag B03. This has the parts for the lead screw to go through. So this is gonna bolt through here with these silver screws like that m3 screws and there will be a lock nut or sorry a lock washer in between the plate and this guy slide that on like that so that it's up through the hole and then just a nut on this far end i'm not going to tighten it down because that'll allow me to slide the um, lock washer in the space for the next ones. I find it easiest to slide the lock washer in and then put the screw up through the underside, making sure that it goes through the washer. And two more. Okay, so those are nice and tight on there. The next step here is assembling this onto the X rail. And so if we look at the two 2020s that we have, First of all, one shorter than the other. Um, secondly, this one has two recessed holes on either end, and that's for the M5 socket caps to bolt in the top. So I know it's not that one. So that leaves this one. And there are two recessed holes here. They're recessed on both sides, and there's nothing on this other end. And so, those two recessed holes are going to correspond with these threaded inserts. They line up like that. You can put it either way. I don't think the direction matters. I think one side might be a little more aesthetically pleasing. So we'll go with that. And we've got these M5 bolts, two of them. And they are going to, with lock washers, bolt the two of these pieces together.
Now I don't have these fully tightened yet. There will be a little bit of play in this. And the way I've always assembled these things is making sure that the two of these are flush. And if they can't be flush, at least if they're equally spaced so that they're um, parallel, so that this X rail is parallel to the top of this, right? In this case, they're both completely flush with one another. I'm happy with that. Tighten these down. I do find that the coating on these bolts is a little thick and this Allen key does not really fit in there that well. The one side of the Allen key won't even fit in. Let's take a look at what the next step is. So I just went to shimmy the, the base over a little bit and on the bottom of the power supply, there's this bolt here holding something on. Uh, this was pre-assembled from the factory and this bolt sticks out quite a ways to the point where it's actually resting on the table um, at the same time that your feet are touching. And so just be careful of that. You might want to grind that down. There's nothing holding this side of the power supply up um, unless I've forgotten something. It doesn't look to be anything holding this side up. So it really just should be almost bent up just a little bit more. If I could put some pressure on that. So just uh, be cognizant of that anyway. Don't want to be doing that on your dining room table or something. Anyway, back to the X rail here. So now we're going to be working on this side, which includes this bracket. Um, we're also going to need some of the parts from the bag that we opened with the end stop, specifically this part. Again, just uh, it's got the brown plastic protecting film either end. There we go. So we're going to attach another end stop to this in the same way we did before. Um, but if you're looking at it like this, there, it's going to go like that. And so we'll just use these self tapping screws over by the connector. So this is the x-axis limit switch, it goes over here. The diagram shows it going through two of these holes, which are for the x-axis motor, which is going to go through here like this. And so we'll be bolting through this bracket for the limit switch, through the metal bracket, and into the stepper motor on the bottom two screws. So we're going to use the longer black M3s. go through the bracket, and then we have shorter um, black M3s for the top ones. I've oriented the uh, stepper motor with the um, connector facing down. It is, it has just enough clearance um, to allow you to get the connector still in there. Um, and I figure we want the cables draping towards the table, so that made sense to me. So there is a little bit of play from left to right, um, or in the X direction, if you will, for the mounting screws for the stepper motor. Um, sometimes this is used similarly to the idler on the Y to be able to apply pressure, uh, tension to the belt. Um, so I'm gonna start with this all the way inwards. And I'll tighten down the bottom two screws with that all the way inward. Then the top two are much shorter, like M3 by fives or so. So once again, we have this tooth pulley. In this case, it doesn't have a set screw or grub screw inserted yet. That's separate in this package. There we go. So again, it tells you between 17.5 and 17.7 .7 millimeters um, from the base of the stepper motor to the top of um, the gear. In my case, 
Uh, again, I'm gonna kind of eyeball it, but I know that it needs to align with the middle of this groove. That's where the belt uh, path is going to be. And it can be easily adjusted by loosening this grub screw later. Um, oh, there are actually two holes for grub screws and one of them already had a grub screw in it. So now we have both. There is no flat on the stepper motor on the pole there. So we're just tightening it as best we can around the edges. And if you look at it like that, it should align with the, uh, the groove. So for the hot end carriage, we're gonna use the parts from bag B04-1. Contains the wheels for the X carriage, the hot end assembly, as well as M5, well, long M5, three of them, and short ones, two of them. This looks like an M4 here. And it says, this is very much like a X carriage for a CR10 or anything like that. So we're going to put these longer ones, there should be three of them. So they're going to go through the flat part of the plate like that. And then on the back, similar to how we did on the Y, we're gonna have spacers. So there's two aluminum spacers and then the wheels. Once again, the middle of these wheels is not always aligned. So you might have to use an Allen key to align that. Uh, so spacers, wheels, and then a nylock nut. We'll just leave those really loose. Like that, And then on the bottom, slightly different because it's gonna have the eccentric nut. So this is going to be another one of the long M5s, uh, the opposite direction this time. So this is going to bolt from the back side through. So we're gonna have the M5 through the wheel, a spacer, little golden spacer, the eccentric nut with that little lip facing away from the wheel. Now all of that is going to go through the back side of the plate. And then on the front side here, we're going to have the lock nut. Okay, so they're all on there and the eccentric nut is properly seated in the larger hole in the bottom. So we will want to take a second and make sure that the eccentric nut is loose. So if you watch the wheel as you spin the eccentric nut, you'll see it kind of move in and out as, as we rotate. You wanna make sure that this is loose so that you can actually slide it on here. In my case, it's tight. There we go. Perfect. And then I can just tighten it. Do my test with the wheels. Looks good. Okay. Perfect. So now using the bag B04 without the dash one, uh, we can assemble the other side of the X carriage, or sorry, the X axis. So before we start bolting things to this bracket, let's make sure that we know how this is oriented. Holding the bracket up, you see this little cut corner that matches this cut corner and it goes on the back side of the frame or the rail like that. So that means that all of the bolts that we put through for the wheels are going to come through the front and the wheels will be out the back side of this bracket. That's important because I myself have actually assembled this backwards before. So let's put in a bolt in this bottom hole here one of these long M5 bolts. This, this hole happens to be larger than the other two that we're gonna use. So there's this one, this one, and this one. It's larger because it has an eccentric nut. 
So find the eccentric nut here. Here it is. So put it with the lip down so that it sits inside that hole. And then we're going to put a spacer and then a wheel and then one of these lock nuts. I'm just gonna loosely thread it on there for now. We'll do the other two. Another M5 in the top hole, a spacer, the wheel and another lock nut. And once again, in the bottom one. And lock nut. Okay, before I go tightening those up, the last hole we're gonna use is this one. It is threaded and it's threaded for this silver M4. Now this one is actually going to go in the front as well, but since it's threaded, it's not gonna go all the way through. It's gonna sit like that. This is for the idler. So it's gonna be these two bearings, again, with their shoulders opposite one another to make a track in the middle. So put those on the M4 like that. And then there's a smaller M4 spacer, a little aluminum spacer, add that on. And then that, as I said, gets threaded into here. Now in the manual, they do show a nut on the back as well. Now, you know, the bracket's not very thick. I'm not sure if they maybe don't trust the threading on the bracket, but we're gonna add the nut as well. Let's tighten that down. And once you have that tight, if you wanna tighten this nut, you're not gonna be able to screw through to continue tightening because the bracket is threaded. You'll just keep tightening those threads. You'll have to turn that guy. So that all spins nicely. And now we'll just tighten these three down. So now that we have the bracket fully assembled, on the side that the wheels are on, we're gonna thread in these little stubby M5s and attach T-nuts to them very loosely. Those T-nuts are what's gonna secure this bracket to the back of the 2020 rail. There we go. So line those kind of horizontal and we should be able to just pop them in the back of there. There we go. I'm not sure how far, not sure how far down this is supposed to be. Obviously it can only go so far because then the idler is hitting. Um, so I'll just kind of eyeball it. I don't think that they give us any real guideline. Um, it does mention don't tighten them all the way in case you do need to adjust it later. So I'm basically at the limit where this T-nut is barely in the end of the extrusion still. I'm actually gonna tighten it down quite a bit. All right, so now we can slide this onto the uprights, which we haven't yet bolted in. So we need bag B01, here we are, B01. Try not to mix it with all the remnants of the other bags here. And so we've got your standard M5 bolts with lock washers and those are going to bolt up underneath these pieces into the bottom of these guys. Now, sometimes these have a direction to them, like they're pre-threaded or something for say a Z stepper motor. These are not, so it doesn't matter which way they go. So I'll put this guy like that and then thread this. I'm just going to get them started by hand and then I'll probably move the machine to the edge of the table. So as you're tightening these down, you might notice that there's quite a bit of play in the upright. 
And so what I'm doing is making sure that it is completely flush with the side of these rails. That kind of gives you uh, positioning from an inside outside perspective, but also to make sure that it's not twisted. And then this guy should just slide over top. We got lucky. We may have had to have adjust those uh, eccentric nuts on the inner side there to allow us the space, much like the Y axis. But that slid on, seems good. So the manual does state these should be 250 millimeters apart. Um, I don't happen to have a, a caliper here that does 250 at this moment. Um, so I just used lining it up with the edges of the extrusion and that seems fine. We'll know better when we bolt the top rail on to make sure that they are stiff and then we'll make sure it still slides evenly up and down. So the rest of those long M5 screws from that last package are for the top here and it is recessed on one side. That's going to go upwards to allow the heads of these to sit in the extrusion. Throw another lock washer on there and thread those in the top. So it is interesting that with these two threaded in, not tightened yet, there's not a lot of wiggle room there. We can see that this side is already out a little bit. Um, and to get them to bolt in, we're gonna have to push this in a little, uh, which likely indicates we should move the base inwards, loosen those two bolts and slide that over, giving it the 250 millimeter spacing they had mentioned earlier. Uh, if we just push this in to get those threaded in, we may end up having them kind of tipped in like that, which will affect how this rides up and down from a pressure perspective at least. There would suddenly be, in our case since we're pushing it in, there'd be a lot of pressure on the inner wheels and none on the outer. Um, when we bring this up to the top though, it does it does pull, pull it almost perfectly in. So you know what? In our case, maybe we'll just get those threaded in. It would be a good idea to ensure that you have calipers or something accurate, you know, maybe a, a long ruler in millimeters um, to measure 250 millimeters or 25 centimeter spacing. Yeah, that's not right. So as I slide it up on this side, all the wheels have pressure against the rail and they're all spinning on their own. Um, even though I didn't adjust that eccentric nut, they have a reasonable amount of pressure. And on this side, down here, this inner wheel is spinning on its own. It's making contact with the rail, as are both of the outers. But the moment I get to about here, there's no more pressure on the inner wheel. It's just sitting there idle. Um, and so that tells us that this is actually bent out like this, yeah. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen the bottom screws here because they have a little bit of wiggle room unlike the top. I may also loosen the top. I'll ride this up and down um, with pressure on all these wheels which should end up kind of leveling itself out. So what I did was I made sure the eccentric nut was extremely tight and the wheels have a fixed spacing. So I used that to line the top and retighten these bolts and then move it to the bottom and then retighten the bolts on this one side. And so now the whole way up, it has equal pressure against the rails. So now using bag B04-2 has this little flat, looks like plastic bracket in it. There's also a bearing. So this is, yeah, and this is 3D printed. It is for the lead screw at the top. And this bearing is going to go in there like that. Usually they just use some screws in the top to kind of pinch that down. Maybe these flat ones, let's double check. Nope, they're using the button head screws, M5s, and they have actually are these holes tapped? Nope. So these will just tap themselves in. So 
So these two screws are just to kind of hold the um, bearing in this flat plate. So they just pinch down like that. And we do want to make sure we're installing this bearing from the top so that this little notch is like that because that's going to sit right here. In these two holes, we're going to use these flat topped M5 bolts, really short ones. And again, some hammer nuts. And then this hammer nut here is actually going to fit right between the two bolts that we attach this top bar. So like that. And it basically makes it flush with the side. Whenever I can only see one of the two uh, hammer nuts, I always do the one I can't see first. That way I can kind of do the pull test and see if it engaged. The other one that I can see, I can always just look to see if it turns. There we go. Okay, now we may want to actually leave these a little bit loose for some adjustment because we want to make sure that we're not kind of forcing the lead screw to be on an angle or anything. In the next step, they talk about tightening the two bolts on the back here that attach this green bracket to the back of the 2020. We had already tightened those. Um, in the same kind of paragraph, they talk about adjusting the inner eccentric nuts on these wheels, which we already did. Um, I guess those nuts or the bolts on the back there, if we left them loose, we would have been able to use some of the play of this bracket to take up some of that slack that we were noticing as it rode up and down. But the fact remains that one of them was kind of off kilter. Regardless, we've checked the eccentric nuts. Everything's good there. Those bolts on the back are tight. So now we're going to add the Z axis stepper motor. Uh, that's in bag B07. Well, not the stepper motor itself, but all the bits to assemble it. So we've got this little metal bracket here. We've got the little flex coupler, which is eight millimeters on one side and five on the other. And we have our stepper motor that doesn't have the gear on it. It's the only one left. Obviously this is going to slide on here. It already has some grub screws in there and they seem to be a little bit too tight to allow us to slide that on. And there is a flat on this shaft, so I'm gonna align this with the flat. Now that I think about it, I could have used this stepper motor with the flat for the x-axis stepper motor. Uh, there's a lot more pressure on the x-axis um, drive gear than there is on the Z. The Z's not really doing anything pressure-wise, this is. Um, Ultimately, it probably doesn't make a difference, but I'll, I'll likely go back and swap those. So here's our stepper motor. This little bracket is going to bolt on top of it. And it's got a little curve here that faces the coupler like that. It allows us to bolt down in and they're recessed. And then it will allow us to bolt in to some more T-nuts or hammer nuts into the back of the upright. So we need M3s. We have some M3s here. They are these tapered pan head ones so that they'll recess. They are Phillips again. So grab our Phillips screwdriver from before. And I'm just aligning it so that it's flush with the back of the stepper. Okay, there we go. And now will it be M4s? Yes. Would have probably been easier to do before I put on the coupler, but oh well. Slide the M4s in there. We have these M4 hammer nuts. Okay. Align them vertically so that they will slide right in the channel. Let's lift this guy up.
and you can look down through the channels here and see that the hammer nuts have turned. Yeah, that's tight. Okay, let's take let's take this guy off. Gives us a much better angle at these screws. So when they were installing in the manual, when they showed the flex coupler being installed to the motor shaft, they showed this little rubber O-ring and it quite literally just shows it being dropped in there. Like it's not stretched over top of the motor shaft or anything. I, I don't quite understand the point. Um, I usually leave a little bit of space between my, where my lead screw comes down into the coupler and where the shaft for the motor is so that they're not actually touching. Um, maybe that's the point of the, the little rubber O-ring. Let's slide the lead screw in. Yeah, we're gonna loosen the bolts up here to allow us to adjust the positioning of this bracket. There, let it just float. grabbing this. Yeah, you know what? So the lead screw is actually binding on, um, on the bearing there. So I'm just gonna take this off while I slide it down. And once I've got it situated, I'll double back and put that back on. Back off these grub screws to make sure that the lead screw there is seated properly. All right, we're gonna take a different approach here. I'm gonna detach the coupler from the Z motor and slide it into the, slide the lead screw into it up here. Something is just not letting this lead screw go in. Oh, there we go. Okay. There. Now it's properly sitting there. Okay. Now with that part done, this should just, with any luck, slide right down on top of the motor. This seemed awfully hard to turn. There shouldn't be that kind of resistance and there isn't any more. The solution there was loosening these nuts and allowing this little threaded collar to kind of float um, and find its own center, if you will. Um, and so now it moves up and down freely. What is interesting is the placement of the lock washers is between the threaded coupler and the bracket. So there's actually nothing putting pressure against the nuts themselves. And so if these are really loose, like this one inner one, it, it'll end up just rattling itself completely loose. So now that it's um, kind of found its proper home, I'm just gonna tighten them back up. We're gonna need to grease this. This is all very dry. There's no lubrication at all. So that's just resonating between the coupler and the Z rod. Okay, so with that done, we can re reinstall the top bracket. Depending on who you ask, these are not really necessary and in some cases can cause more problems than they're worth, um, especially if it's out of alignment and bending the Z rod. Um, in this case, what I'm gonna do is just move this kind of all the way to the top So this is where the bracket is happiest. Let it self-align. 
All right, so I think we're done there. So now we're ready to install the extruder and the extruder motor. So the stepper motor itself, I probably want the cables to maybe go out the back. So we'll assemble it that way. Um, they have it kind of pointing to the side. They have it pointing this way. So I'll install it like that. And the Titan extruder just kind of sandwiches onto the plate like that. And we're going to use these really long M3 bolts. And they will just go through the three holes in the extruder. Or, yeah, in the extruder and into the stepper motor. It will be a little bit tricky at first because you're getting the gears on the uh, extruder stepper motor to nest in with the, the big gear here. And so there's a little bit of a pivot and if you pivot it one way, there's you know not enough contact and if you pivot another, there's, there's plenty. Once you get the rest of the screws installed, that will stop any of the pivoting, but you may need to wiggle it back and forth to get those, those two gears to nest properly together. And this is plastic, so don't go crazy with tightening these. The one I would probably tighten the most is the one that goes through the big gear. So now we're gonna route the belt uh, for the X-axis. I've spun the machine around so you can see this bit a little bit clearer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes there's just slits instead of uh, it being kind of a hole in the middle that you have to thread things through. And in this case, we just have slits. So these little fingers here are what we're gonna wrap the belt around. Same process as last time. Um, we want all the teeth to face inward and we're gonna nest the teeth on top of each other. And in this case, we can actually um, zip tie them together before assembling it and just slide it on like that. So I'm just gonna make the loop as small as possible and I'll trim off the excess. And what I like to do, I don't know if it makes a difference at all, is I alternate the way I put on the zip ties. So really tight like that. Snip. Unless there's a reason not to do it. In some cases you just don't have a clearance or something. Um, but so I've got the nub on the one side and then I put the nub on the other side for the next one. Just, I found that some, sometimes the belt will kind of twist or kink a little bit. This kind of counteracts the first kink. So now that one, we can just slide on here. Barely big enough, perfect. Okay. And then we're going to wrap it around, and I'll flip this. So we're gonna wrap it around the idler here, and unlike something like a Ender 3 or CR10 where the belt path goes up here, you can see the idler is actually too low. So in this case, the belt path actually goes in the groove on the bottom of the extrusion, like this. Hopefully that makes sense. Because we've got the X carriage already assembled, I have to thread the belt above the bottom wheel to get to the other side. There. Hopefully that makes sense. So it looks like that. So now I'm going to wrap this around the other little finger on the carriage and we're going to put zip ties. But because we have no tension at all, we need to adjust the tension, which comes back to those slotted holes that we bolted the stepper motor through. And if you remember, and you can kind of see there, we slid it all the way in so it's as slack as possible. 
and we can use those and push the motor outwards to apply tension to this belt. Um, but what I'll do is uh, wrap it around the finger, apply as much tension as I can and nest the teeth like that and take it off the finger. So now I know that is about as tight as I could get it. And what I'll do is I'll tighten it by one or two teeth. So this is my slack side, one or two teeth tighter. There we go. And now I'll put my zip ties on there. We have very little ability to tension with this. Um, unlike ones where this is on uh, T-nuts and slides inside this rail, you have uh, tons and tons of tension ability. We need to make sure we've got this reasonably tight from the get-go. So that's not really tight at all. I might actually need to go another tooth over. That's why you don't cut it, unlike the first one I did, don't cut it until you're sure. So I'm just gonna tighten this by a few more teeth. Okay, so now we have a rather tight belt, but not too tight. And it seems like the wheels might be too tight. Yeah, they are definitely too tight. Earlier, uh, I had mentioned that I was just attaching the gear onto the stepper motor here so that it was in line with the center groove. And after moving things back and forth, I think it could probably come inward a millimeter or so. Oh, there is a flat on this one as well. Perfect, I don't need to swap it. So now I can trim off the rest of this excess belt. Great. Uh, so the next step is we're gonna add the Z axis limit switch. So over here, it currently doesn't know when it's all the way down. So there's one more of these limit switches and another one of these little plastic plates. We're going to bolt like that, leaving the little oval for the adjustable adjustability along the um, M5 screw. And we'll grab two more of these Phillips head self-tapping screws. Great. Grab another M5, flat, flat head bolt. Put a hammer nut on it. And then we're going to install this in the upright here. Okay. And then we'll need to see exactly where that needs to go. We'll have to install the hot end first though, obviously. So now we need this metal plate and the bolts from bag B04 that we dumped out earlier. Specifically, we need these two silver M3 bolts and they are going to go through these two holes in the back of the plate here, like that. And then they are going to bolt onto the two holes in the back of the X carriage. Okay. So now the hot end has four th tapped threaded holes in the cold side here in the heat sink. And that's going to bolt through the four holes on top of this bracket like that. And to do so, we're gonna use the rest of the black M3 bolts that we have. Okay, so we're out of bags other than the gift bag, which is really just a bunch of spare parts, I guess. Um, we have no other spare parts, which is usually a good sign. Uh, we haven't connected any of the cables. Uh, seems pretty self-explanatory, but they didn't mention it in the manual. So the hot end cable is just another one of these aircraft connectors. Oh, 
not sure how we want to route the cabling. Um, usually we'll use the Bowden tube as a guide. So let's throw the Bowden tube in here, all the way in. And in the hot end, okay, good. Then we could tuck these, yeah. Sorry. In the hot end here, there is a little gap at the top. Maybe you can see that there. It's a little cutout to route the wiring. And so I'm going to, as best I can, move the wires inside that cutout and then push this down there like that. Good. And then I'll just take some zip ties, zip tie it along the Bowden tube, around the back, and then down to where it plugs in. So again, just another aircraft connector and it's keyed like the first one was. So line up that little notch. There we go. And then last but not least would be the cables for the end stops and the stepper motors. And those are all tucked up under here from before. All right. We never connected the power supply as well. So, so a short cable here, we have Zed. It's a small one. It's just for the end stop. They have these nice yellow tags on them all, so you know where they go. Longer one here is labeled Y. So that's for the Y axis stepper motor, which was in the front of the unit underneath that green plate. Be careful here. I can actually plug him in. We may as well grab the LCD cables and connect the LCD. There are two of them here. They're also keyed, so they only go in one way. You have EXP2 and EXP1. Just match them up with the corresponding one on the board. EXP2 to 2 over by the power supply. Bit of a tight fit. And then EXP1. Two EXP1. So now, as far as wire management goes, um, you can print these nice little clips that will clip these types of flat cables to the underside of the extrusion here, or even to clip them here. Um, for now, I'm just gonna leave them. This is uh, the XT60 connector, which is power. And on the board, what do they have? Ah. It's tucked inside the power supply. There we go. So XT60 to XT60, like that. Just tuck that in there like that for now. And then we can flip it back over and do the rest of the cables. So what are we left with? We have one that says Z, and it's for a motor. So that's going to plug into the Z motor with the lead screw. We have X, that guy is right here. So we have E, E, I'm not sure why they labeled it twice, but that's the extruder. Make sure we're not getting these tangled. So 
See the extruder is the Titan extruder there. And then we have a smaller X, that's for the limit switch for X. This guy right here. And this is Y and it's a small one. So this is the limit switch for Y, which was at the back here by the idler. Easiest way is going to be How the heck is that going to reach? So this Y here needs to reach this limit switch over here. So we're going to have to feed that back through the control box, I think. So we actually don't need it coming out this side at all. It's tight fit in the hole there. there. So I'm going to have to snip the zip tie on these wires. To give me the necessary slack to reach that. I'm just gonna re-zip tie these to keep this nice and tidy. So you can see there, the one heat sink here is like half off the stepper. What are they using here? Looks like four nine eight eights. Should we attach that? Okay. So now that we have all this slack, this is going to go to the limit switch for Y. Would have been nice if they had a proper spot for those wires to come out or plug right in the back. And do we have any left unconnected? Looks like we're good. Yep. We're good. Okay. So now all that's left is we're going to do some wire management. We'll use some zip ties, tie this up, make sure nothing is going to get caught as things move around. So as the heat bed moves forward and back, we want to make sure that this cable is, you know, not um, crossed with other cables, which it currently is. Because if that gets caught mid print, uh, you're going to have a bad time. There. All right. So we'll get all this mess cleaned up. We'll get the wire management handled here and uh, we'll probably stick the heat bed sticker on. So this has 3M 9080A adhesive. Just stick it right on the hotbed like that. Um, we may clip on glass, I'm not sure. We'll do some prints and we'll be back. So before we go printing anything, of course, we have to level our bed. So we will go to prepare. And near the bottom here, there should be preheat PLA, that'll do. And so that is now turned on the cooling fans. So they have it programmed for 50 degrees on the bed and 200 on the hot end. I'm just going to turn the cooling fans off. So the hotbed took a lot longer than I expected, being 24 volts to heat up, but now that we're at 50, I can actually do some bed leveling. I'm just gonna take a look to see if they have any level corners or bed leveling options in the menus here. Nothing in prepare, there's not gonna be anything in control either. No. Okay, that's disappointing. Um, Marlin has the options of putting um, level corners, which will automatically bring the hot end to each of the four corners and optionally to the center as well. Um, to move the hot end manually, we're going to have to actually disable the steppers, um, which unfortunately disables the Z as well, which could cause the Z to lower, uh, affecting our results. Uh, the other option is that you would just home all axes, axes, sorry, auto home, and then you could manually move individual axes 
Um, so move X and Y and put it, you know, a couple inches in from the corner and then do your uh, leveling that way. I'm just going to do um, the disable steppers option and just make sure not to put any downward pressure on the hot end. So I can now freely slide this guy and slide the bed. And you probably want to be careful and make sure that the bed is really tightened down so that there is a gap and you don't end up scraping the, um, the surface. And so righty tighty lefty loosey, just loosen the knob until there is some friction between the bed and the paper. There we go. And then I'll just slide this guy over here. We can actually hear it rubbing against the build surface. Tighten the knob to provide some clearance. So once we've gone around once, we should probably go a second time around. And what I'm noticing is on this side here, this back corner is extremely high. And then the moment it comes across the front here, there's a gap between the, the nozzle and the bed. Quite literally at that point right there, there is so much of a gap that there is no drag at all. And just another inch away, you, you honestly can't even get the paper in anymore. It's, it's almost as if like the bed is, is stable, the, the eccentric nuts are tight. It's almost as if something somewhere is bent, whether it's the actual heat bed itself is kind of warped or something to do with the wheels and the track they're riding on. But that's pretty rapid change in height in the matter of 50 millimeters travel or so. And then when we get to the front, it's completely tight again. So that means the way that this is currently operating, this entire area here, we're not gonna be able to, to print on. If we move this in a little bit, things get a little bit better. But again, there's no clearance at the front. And then in the center here, there's just miles of clearance. And we know it's not the wheels on the X because we haven't moved the X at all. It's only the Y that we've been moving. And to remove me, you know, pressing down on the bed as I move it from the equation, we can use the belt and the exact same thing is present, tight at the back and a gap in the middle. Um, so I'm gonna have to probably do some live leveling with the uh, test print. That's as close as it's gonna get for now. So let's plug in the SD card. It says card inserted. Go to print from SD. And there's a folder called test. And in there, there's something called support G code. So before I print that though, we don't have a spool holder. So I'm going to borrow a spool holder from another machine, throw in some filament, and then let's print this. Whoops. Now we see the bed heating up to 80 degrees. Uh, I, I don't know what they're expecting us to be printing. I would have assumed PLA, which is 50 is more than hot enough with this build surface. Um, I'm going to go into the tune menu and go to bed and just turn that down to 50 degrees. 80 is, it's just going to be melting the PLA sitting on top of it. And even 55 is more than enough. Once it gets to 55, we'll be able to see what, uh, what the set temperature is for the hot end. So now that the bed has reached temperature, it's auto homing and we can see the hot end is set to 230 degrees. Again, for PLA, that is way too hot. So I'm going to lower that to 215, even that's on the hot side. And there we go. So here we are about three and a half hours later. This was printed like this on the bed. And as we can see the first layer here, I had to live level it because of that dish in the bed, or at least I'm assuming it's a dish at this point. I did lay a ruler across the front, uh, the center here, 
and it doesn't appear that the bed is dished, but something is causing the bed to, to either tip or lower. Um, I'm gonna have to take a good look at the wheels and how they're running on this track. Um, but regardless, um, we're a little far away from the bed in some spots, close in the center, and again, far away over here. Um, so I kind of just split the difference, got the first layer to at least stick, and then everything built off, off the top of that. Um, the jerk is ex set extremely high on this. Um, if I go to control and under motion, the jerk, so the jerk's only 10. So I'm not sure if they're using jerk um, in the G-code um, and controlling the jerk through G-code, but the nozzle was just whipping around. Um, you know, very slow for the outer walls, but the inner stuff, it was just kind of uh, bolting back and forth. Um, but it looks like we have a spool holder at the end of it. Um, there is some inconsistent layers here. It's not really a shift because it's actually bulged out on both sides. Um, and it seems to bulge right at the end of the tapered section here. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of interested to print this again. And as I said earlier, I'm not sure what material they thought we were printing at 80 and 230 degrees. Um, that would be cooking the PLA that we were using here. Um, but we have a spool holder and the way that this looks like it's supposed to attach is this little finger goes into a groove like this and then the weight just keeps that kind of locked in. Now, um, this groove is larger than a 2020, so it is, you know, this little notch here is sitting below the rail, not kind of nested underneath and kind of clipped on. Um, but, you know, of course we don't want the spool running this way nor this way. We need it out the side like this. Um, so I'm gonna assume that this is meant to click on to the side of the, the rail here and not where the foot is because that obstructs its ability to clamp on. But then I think we're too close to the, to the stepper. Um, so honestly, I'm gonna have to check the manual, maybe read online where they expect you to mount this. Um, I'm not a fan of it just kind of sitting there, um, you know, staying on the rail just by the weight of the spool itself, especially as you get down near the end of the spool. But at least we got something to print. Um, I do have some concerns, of course. You know, I like my Titan extruders. I have those on almost all of my machines. Um, I do like this hot end because I've used it a lot on the TiVo Flash that we reviewed previously. Um, and you know, just swapping out uh, the Bowden tube for something like Capricorn uh, gives me kind of a volcano, like an old style volcano, just a longer melt zone. Um, and I've, I've printed high temperature materials quite a bit on, uh, on my flash. So I'm assuming that this one will be able to do the same. I probably wouldn't do them on this build tack surface. I would put um, some sort of a glass surface on there, maybe something with PEI. Um, but I've, in my experience, I've had a lot of materials weld to this as this would have at 230 and 80 degrees. Anyway, it's uh, quite an involved build, a little bit more involved than something like a uh, Ender 3. Um, so hopefully you're, uh, you're prepared to undertake something like this. Hopefully you found all of this useful. Remember, like and subscribe and ring the bell to get notified when we upload more videos like the TiVo. Thanks for watching. <laughs>